Now's the time for our meditation. So I invite you to get really comfortable in your chair. Close your eyes. And we'll begin taking some deep breaths and settling into this now perfect moment of letting our mind rest a bit. Breathing in deeply, breathing out. Feel your shoulders relaxing. Breathe in deeply so that you fill your belly full of air and then you let it out with a sigh. Signaling to your body that this is your time, your time of rest. Now as you begin to settle in, I invite you to bring into your mind a memory of a time in your life where someone may have criticized you for something that you did. Maybe it was something that you created. Maybe it was something you wrote or sang or drew. Maybe it was just some passion where someone criticized you and you put that thing away. You sort of let the energy go, believing what this person said had some truth in it. So this well-meaning adult, well-intentioned person may have squelched a dream that you had, a passion that you were really into. And so I invite you to go back to that time. And what I'd like you to do now is, as we go into the quiet, I would like for you to see a different outcome. See that person praising your work and encouraging you instead. And we do this in the silence. You see, reframing our stories that we have in our mind is one of the easiest ways to get rid of blocks and barriers to our good, beliefs that no longer serve us. And so this is an opportunity, really an exercise in forgiveness. Because I would be willing to bet that because you were discouraged in some area of your life, it motivated you in another way to be more of that, to do more of that, just to show that person. So there was a gift in that as well. So we just see it differently. We change our perspective. And in this moment, with love in our hearts, we can even see this person who gave us this criticism in a new light. We can love and bless them and appreciate them and let that energy that we may have been holding, that old belief, just simply dissipate into nothingness. Let yourself feel differently about it. 
knowing that no one can ever say or do anything to you that can ever take your good away. Not unless you let them. So we choose now in this moment to know that every single thing that has happened is a gift. And we choose in this moment now to see it that way. And we're grateful for this opportunity to know the truth and to let the truth set us free. We say thank you, God, for these tools, for these abilities to change our thinking and change our lives. And now we bring our focus back into the room with gratitude in our hearts. We say thank you, indwelling spirit, for this sweet little remembrance time. And so it is, and so we choose it. Amen. Whenever you're ready, just open your beautiful eyes. I would like to dedicate the service today to Ruby Tim and her family, um, Carla and her, her daughter Carla and her son Patrick, and Marjorie and Rose have a very close relationship, the four of them, to our cousins and to our brother and sister. And I know that they are moving through a tough time, and so I, I told them on the phone yesterday that I was going to dedicate the service to Ruby because she will be missed. So I was reading in the brand new uh, Unity magazine, there was an article, there's some really good articles in there this month. And there was one by Dawson Church, and he's a PhD. And he was talking about how at the beginning of the pandemic, he lives in Northern California. He was downtown in one of his favorite areas, headed to his favorite pub. When he got there, there was a sign on the door and it said, closed permanently, we don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you for 31 great years. Now, this was at the very beginning of the pandemic. So a little bit of time goes by, and he wants to have some other kind of food, tired of cooking at home, looking for takeout, and he checks into um, Betty's Barbecue. So he calls Betty's Barbecue, and he asks for takeout, and he goes, and he shows up, and this little place is right around the corner from the pub. It's the same area and everything. And Betty's got this thriving takeout business. And he said, I'm just curious. You're doing, you seem to be doing very well. He had to like wait in line, you know, six feet apart for his order. And she said, you know, it's the most interesting thing. She said, for years I have wanted to have a takeout business. And I never did do it. And she said, now... We are so busy that every one of the wait staff has a job in the kitchen to try to keep up with all the orders. So there you go. Same area, same situation, same circumstances, same town. What's the difference? Two different mindsets, two different ways of seeing it. One going forward and one sort of stepping back. So you could say one is in resistance and one is in acceptance. I love it. Um, Dawson's article said he's a PhD and so he writes about a lot of um, scientific sorts of things. And he has a book recently out called Bliss Brain. And he says that we have this sliver of neuron tissue in our brain that sort of controls emotion and learning. And when he was talking about this, this, this town and what had happened to his two favorite places, he said, all it takes is one new thought. So this article in the Unity magazine is called New Thought. One new thought is all it takes. And you know, Dr. Dispenza talks about that a lot. You just have to do something a little different every day to kind of keep that brain alive and going on. So he says, imagination can activate this part of our brain to banish the fear that stifles creativity. So this is good to know. This is something that 
we need to consider when we're feeling like we're in the doldrums because we've been cocooning for so many months. So we have this affirmation for acceptance. Let's say it together. I release resistance and experience acceptance. You see, I feel like we are incredibly blessed to have these amazing bodies that have these built-in systems that let us know when something feels right and something doesn't. When we're tuned in and tapped in and paying attention to our bodies, we know when something is awry. We feel it. We feel it in our bodies. We know what tension means. We know what headaches mean. So I think that when we understand about this divine intelligence that lives within us, we know that we have this wisdom that is infinite, and we can tap into that. But we have to pay attention to it, and we have to listen to the guidance when we ask for it. We are here paying attention now because we know that what we feel makes a difference. We feel what we need to do. It's not so much an intellectual thing. It's a heart thing. It's a heart-centered thing. So life is going to happen. Change is going to happen. Things are going to unfold all the time. So we have the choice. Are we going to resist it or are we going to accept it and kind of go with the flow? Well, in Eckhart Tolle's A New Earth, he has a section in there and he says this. Whenever tragic loss occurs, you either resist, and his word is, or you yield. Some people become bitter or deeply resentful. Others become compassionate, wise, and loving. Yielding means inner acceptance of what is. You are open to life. Resistance is an inner contraction, a hardening of the shell of the ego. You're closed down. Whatever action you take in a state of inner resistance will create more outer resistance, and the universe will not be on your side. Life will not be helpful. When you yield internally, when you surrender, a new dimension of consciousness opens up for you. If action is possible or necessary, your action will be in alignment with the whole and supported by creative intelligence. Coincidences start to happen. You see synchronicities everywhere. If no action is possible, you rest in the peace and the inner stillness that come with surrender. You rest in God. So think about it a minute. Don't you know people when there has been a tragic loss in a family where one person completely shuts down and they feel like their life is over and nothing's ever the same? I haven't. Uh, my mom's cousin was like that when her daughter died in a car accident. It was like she just couldn't live anymore. She was like... That girl was her light, and she'd lost her light. And then you think about all these other people. What about mothers of drunk drivers? People who lost something tremendous, but then turned around and created something magnificent that's helping hundreds and hundreds of people all the time. We have a choice, don't we? But I love that word, yield. I love that word as opposed to to acceptance because it seems and feels to me like it's a little gentler. It's like the street sign. You know, you don't have to come to a complete stop and think about it. You just kind of slow down and you look both ways. It, it gives us a time for pause, a time for stepping back and going, oh, oh, okay. And so before we get into immediate resistance, we have a, a time to sort of yield and think about it a little bit differently. So we pause, perhaps, and we reconsider. It's a little bit more gentle than the strong resistance. This week in our book study, we're, we're almost done with Hell in the Hallway, Light at the Door. And we actually talked about those long pauses that people can have. And there's a, an example in there about this guy named Jack who had a very successful marketing career for a number of years. He was good at what he did, but secretly he wanted to be an actor. He'd always wanted to be an actor. And so as what happens, you know, the divine discontent, you know, that urge that says, eh, you know, it doesn't feel as good, it's not as much fun anymore, blah, 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 whatever it is, it starts to come up. And he was like, you know what? Wouldn't it be really great if they just laid me off? 
then then I had severance and I had a little bit of insurance for a little while and that sort of thing and honest to God two weeks later he got laid off he got a good severance package he got some insurance for a few months so we have this within us this divine intelligence that knows what it is that we want and we can co-create that what he said in this story was that you would think that in between losing the job and finding that acting job that it was a panicky time but he said in actuality I saw doors all over the place with my dreams right behind them so his way of seeing it was okay this is an opportunity I have a, a chance to do what I've always dreamed of doing so he said long pauses long hallways can give us these opportunities and advised us to enjoy these opportunities because it can give us time to stop and to breathe and to reorganize and see what it is we want to do next so I think we need to remember this because we are definitely in a long hallway right now not knowing what's at the end of the tunnel yet so really isn't it all about attitude I mean when you think about it he could have been panicked when he lost his job even though he's kind of secretly hoping that that would happen instead he saw it as something good that was gonna allow him to do something fun I um, was on Facebook this week when um, making kindness contagious that Facebook page that my friend started a long time ago there was a story on there and it was called limitless by Logan you see the mother of Logan um, was very proud of her son but he had been born with an extra chromosome and he had disabilities he had some learning disabilities he had some challenges growing up and as he grew up she began to pray because she wondered about what was going to happen to him as she got older was he going to be able to what was he going to do when he got out of high school and how was he going to be able to support himself and all of that and she had this prayer and she said I just want one word about the exceptional person that he is and what he can be and her word came as limitless well it just so happened that Logan loves fashion and so they created a line of baseball caps t-shirts leggings and all of these things things that said limitless by Logan and so all of a sudden there's a Facebook page there's a website the things are flying off the shelves there's money coming in all because this intention in this one prayer of this mother about her son one word that would exemplify Logan she says at the end of the interview she says you know we're all limitless we all are we are the ones that put the limitations on us she said we don't have to be held back there's nothing that has to hold us back Logan is thriving and he is inspiring many people you should look it up limitless by Logan you can even look up his website and see all of his items that he has for sale it's it's just incredible to me so today we're in scripture we're in Colossians we're in chapter 3 verse 12 as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. I love that because it's talking about the way that we want to show up as these Christed beings that we came here to be the peace of Christ rules in our heart that's how we want to show up we want to show up as that regardless of what is going on in the external we want to have that peace in our hearts so what do we do but we just keep our mind on God we 
put God first, and that peace of Christ creates a state of sort of detachment within us that makes us sort of immune to a lot of the things that we see around us. It's an inner out sort of job. In this state that we seek, it rules out anxiety, this peace of Christ in our heart and all other negative thoughts because our mind is concentrating on something else that's more positive and more powerful. So we demonstrate that Christ-like beingness in our lives by having a cheerful outlook, by thinking before we speak, being kind and acting only from the ideal conception of life. Having a thankful, grateful heart goes a long way. Not finding fault, not complaining, these things are not necessarily easy to do in this day and time, but all of these kind things and ways that we can show up help us to, do, to demonstrate the Christ in our daily life. We're more grateful for every aspect of our life when we concentrate on that. So it was, I, I want to say it was in the early 2000s, I was at Unity Village at a conference for the South Central Unity region. And I ran into and met this beautiful couple, Margaret and Frank Pounders. Well, Margaret wrote The Laws of Love. And she, they were just a delightful couple. She has a section in there that I absolutely love. She talks about how we need to understand that it's not what we do, but how we feel about what we do that really makes the difference. So when this scripture is talking about let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, I believe that this has to do with our paying attention and keeping our focus on God no matter what and realizing what we're feeling in our bodies and in our emotions is a reflection and it's showing us what we need to change, what we need to do. Resistance is any attitude, she says, that places a barrier between us and our good. And we know this. This is principle three in unity. So we can feel it in our bodies. And she was telling that there are truth students who actually think that it's almost like being a martyr to work through things feeling that it's not good, but you're putting up with it anyway. You know there's something that you don't like, but you're putting up with it because you think that's what non-resistance means? Well, Margaret says, nothing could be further from the truth. She said, Jesus was a practical man and his teachings were workable. Non-resistance is not passivity. Non-resistance is always the result first of mental activity. Remember Jesus, the master of non-resistance who took the whips and drove the money changers out of the temple? This was not a weak, timid man. He was not a faint-hearted man. So what do you feel? How do you feel? How do you pay attention to what you're feeling in your body? When you know something's not right, you speak up. You speak up and you stand up for yourself. Martyrdom is not non-resistant at all. So when I came up with this title, it's because Byron Katie wrote a book, Learning to Love What Is, and she has the process called The Work, and she has four questions. Well, it, it came about because she was sort of at the end of her rope, the bottom of her life, and she was trying to figure out what it was about the thoughts that she was held had been holding in her mind that were creating what was going on in her life and she wanted better. She wanted different. And so how do we learn to love what is, is what this talk is all about today. Katie says, every time you do the work, you are becoming enlightened to who and what you are, the true nature of your being. To question what you believe is an amazing gift to yourself, and you can have it all the days of your life. 
The answers, she says, are always inside of you, just waiting to be heard. So in her wanting to end her own suffering, she came up with this practical tool, this process of these four steps, these four questions. I think it's a great process. So you know we have these stories, and so it's an opportunity to go back and look at what things, what beliefs we're still holding that are no longer serving us, that are keeping us from our good. So the first question is, is it true? This thing that you're thinking in your mind right now, it's either a yes or a no answer, and we just have to be still, and we have to find our honest answer. And so whatever situation you might be going through, you ask yourself this question. And if it shows up as a yes, yeah, you know, what I'm thinking about this person really is true. Then you go to the question two. Can you absolutely know that this is truth? Now you take this opportunity to look at this story again. You kind of shine a flashlight on that moment in, in time, and you see what it reveals to you. Maybe it isn't all true. Perhaps just a bit of it, right? So you explore further. So question three is, how do you react? What happens when you believe the thought? Where does it show up in your body? So you close your eyes and you witness the feelings, the body sensations, the behaviors that arise in you when you believe that thought. Notice and report those answers to any of these following, following things. How did you treat the other person? How did you treat yourself? Do any obsessions or addictions begin to appear when you believe that thought? Be honest with yourself when you're going through this process. And then question four is, who would you be without that thought? So closing your eyes, you return back and reflect on the situation again. You observe. You observe from your true self and experience the situation again, this time without the thought that created this whole thing. Who or what would you be without this thought? How would you see or feel about this other person? Drop all your judgments and notice what is revealed. You see, what, what we really know is that you're a child of God, and so is this other person you've had this confrontation with. So what makes you feel peace and happiness? How can you get to that place? Is it really worth holding on to a belief that no longer serves, that causes you pain? She says you're not limited by that thought. You're never limited by a thought. You can change that thought in the moment, right? So then she says the opportunity after you've answered these four questions is to completely turn around. So say, for instance, that... Um, I was saying that Paul never listens to me. I would like for him to listen to me, and so he never listens to me. So I've been going through this process, and I've been asking these questions. So now I look at it differently. I turn it around. Paul doesn't listen to me changes to, I don't listen to myself. I don't listen to Paul. He does actually listen to me. So these turnarounds can happen in an absolute instantaneous moment. So you can consider that each turnaround that you find is as true or truer than that original statement that you began with. How empowering is this practice that can change us and change the way we're thinking about these old stories and these old beliefs that no longer serve us? It's a really powerful process and I invite you to Google Byron Katie the work because what's on that website are a thorough opportunity for you to go through and this is the perfect time to do it while we're in this cocooning mode go to a situation that is troubling in your life and work these four questions and then not only that but she has worksheets to take you deeper everything is downloadable and printable and you can actually work through and rid yourself of some things that you might have been carrying around for decades that really are no longer serving you. 
So it's a great resource that she's created. It's just another practical tool to have in your toolbox. I read this quote recently that truth is not found on the internet. It's found from the divine connection within. So really, all of these practical tools that we have, that's why we call Unity Practical Christianity. So we want you to be able to have things that you can use to turn your life around. That wisdom is always there. We just have to remember to reconnect with it. We put God first always, and then we realize how loving what is becomes so much easier. It's time for a little humor. There's a friend of mine in Texas who sent me a whole list of quarantining jokes. So I have two little bitty short ones I want to share with you that I thought were cute. Day 109 of social distancing. I struck up a conversation with a spider today. Nice guy. Seems like a really nice guy. He's a web designer. <laughs> And my favorite one, anyone else getting a 10 from the light in the fridge? Oh. <laughs> I love that. I thought that was so cute. I can identify with that one. So I want to close today. This beautiful booklet that Unity just came out with, Nurture Your Divine Spirit, Spiritual Tools and Practices, is available online. You just go to unity.org and download it. Or Ask for a hard copy and they'll mail you one. This particular one, it was written by Charles Fillmore from Keep a True Lent, and it's called the Sabbath. It says, Sabbath is a state of mind. Sabbath is very confusing to a lot of people. I'm just going to start out by saying that. The Sabbath is a very certain, definite thing. It is a state of mind that humankind enters or acquires when they go into the silence, into the realm of spirit. There they find true rest and peace. The seventh day means the seventh or perfect stage of one's spiritual unfoldment. The Sabbath is an institution was established by humankind, God does not rest from his work every seventh day, and there is no evidence that there has ever been a moment's cessation of the activity of the universe. Not only do we do God's service in praise and song and thanksgiving on the seventh day and on the first day, but every day. In the true Sabbath, our minds are turned to God every moment. And we are ever ready to acknowledge his holy presence in our hearts and in our lives. That's what I want for all of you. Namaste. Thank you. Now is the time for our giving into the good of our community. So I invite you to take your tithes and offerings in your hands. And if you are watching on YouTube or Vimeo or Facebook, if you would click the donate button, we would be so very grateful. Let's say it together. Divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. Thank you, God, that this is so. And so it is, and so we allow it. God bless.